But good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. We're going to uh, not do something different, but uh, Eric Denny from uh, the Y here in Spokane at the Central Y is going to be uh, talking about pedaling for Parkinson's. He thinks he's going to go about 15, 20 minutes to talk about this really awesome program. Um, and then uh, we're going to stop after that and open up the mics and take questions about pedaling for Parkinson's. And I said on the card if we have enough time. If everybody is ready to stick around for another 15 minutes after we get done with those question and uh, answer period, then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, being prepared and having a toolkit for going into the hospital uh, and being that non-spouse person and the type of things you need to take with you so that you can help take care of your family member. Um, that's a, it's a hard title, but we're building a toolkit and so we're gonna, but we're gonna start out with uh, with Eric. Um, a couple things going on. Let's see. Um, Walla Walla on Wednesday at two uh, at the Walt Whitman at the yeah, is that what it's called at the Whitman? Um, Dr. Alder is speaking at two o'clock. Uh, uh, living well with PD at five o'clock in Richland. Um, at the Red Lion, he is also speaking, uh, living well with PD. And then on the 18th, um, at the PRC at 5.30, uh, Dr. Aldred will be speaking about uh, living well with Parkinson's um, as well. So uh, call to RSVP at the PRC, the 509-443-3361. Um, the end of the month, March 27th, there is a program being put on at Sacred Heart. Uh, it is through Sacred Heart and Medtronic, and it's about deep brain stimulation. Um, it's going to be at 9 o'clock in the morning, and um, I have postcards for here, and there. I think they're going to be mailed out as well, but I have postcards here for the Spokane. Uh, that program is going to be Dr. Aldred, Dr. Carlson, the neurosurgeon that does a huge percentage of the deep brain stimulation surgeries in Spokane area and Jamie Mark who works with all of the DBS patients once they start the process and afterwards. Um, what's cool about it this time around is that they're going to broadcast this program from Sacred Heart to all of the telehealth sites that you're currently at. And so if you would like to join in at nine o'clock on March 27th at your site that you're currently at let they're going to they're going to log in just like we normally do but let them know that you're going to come and then um in Spokane we're also going to open up a site at Holy Family so um that site uh, then you just call if you want to go to the Holy Family site call me at the PRC so I can know about how many I think we can fit about 15 people in the room there at Holy Family so um and then April is Parkinson's Awareness Month, so keep your eye out for uh, information on all the things that we're going to be doing. And um, I would like to invite Eric Denny up to talk about pedaling for Parkinson's. <laughs> I'm not used to applause, and I probably won't get it afterwards, so <laughs> it's okay to start with it, I guess. Um, so my name is Eric Denny. I am the health and wellness director uh, at the YMCA here in Spokane. And we've had the privilege to bring on a program that we have seen some great results in already. We haven't been running it very long yet, uh, but we are very excited and are looking at actually growing the program here within Spokane. Uh, we started the program this last fall, finally. The initial recruitment process took a little while. And that's kind of where we were stuck for a while, was getting enough people to hold a class. Currently, we just finished, or are just finishing this week with our very first official session. Uh, we ran a little bit of a pilot program before then, and then we really wanted to look at actually doing some kind of pre-testing and post-testing, not necessarily of physical tests, but really just more of uh, how you feel when doing certain tasks, those kind of things, looking at after the whole process of the class. And so we just, we're just finishing this week our first uh, session and looking to start our next session. And currently we just run it at one facility, but, but we're looking to expand to all three facilities here in Spokane here in the future. Um, 
So when this program was brought to me, uh, actually by some just members of our community who came in and said, we think the Y is a great place for this program. And we sat down to talk about it. And we brought in some people in Spokane who we thought would have some knowledge and have some experience and understand these things. Um, so we actually set up a meeting with Dr. Greeley here in town and and sat down with our our CEO at the Y and brought in some people in the community who either had Parkinson's or were familiar with the program and started figuring out what this program looked like and what the background was. So this program came um, from a doctor who loves to research, and I won't say just Parkinson's, but he does a lot of of uh, brain research stuff with with movement. And he actually has gotten into somewhat um, what they call passive or kind of forced movement. So making your body do almost more than it can at this point do, um, which is not on what this is. Don't worry. He has done some research there, but this isn't what this program is. Um, so he did the study a couple different ways. And so we've now, they've now figured out and put out the guidelines as to exactly what we should be trying to achieve when we're pedaling and what we can do to make sure that we are being successful in this. Um, so came along with the Pedaling for Parkinson's actual program. Uh, there is an actual website. If you just Google Pedaling for Parkinson's, you will find the Pedaling for Parkinson's website. Um, it is mainly run by uh, a lady by the name of Nan Little. She lives over in Seattle. Um, she's one of the big proponents and has done a lot of cycling where she just realized that she felt better um, when she was when she was cycling. And so she was kind of one of the big proponents to get this up and running as well. And so she does a lot of work with the program from a kind of national setting. Uh, this program is running more wise than I can name to you. I know that I'm usually in touch with a lot of Seattle wise that run it. Um, I was just in touch this week with a Y from Twin Cities, Michigan that runs the program. Um, the research was originally done in Ohio, so kind of from Ohio, that area has spread out. And then Nan lives up in Seattle, and she's been such a big proponent of it that it's started to grow kind of this side as well now. Um, so the research was done that they had a group that's the that road, so kind of like the picture shows, um, people riding just a stationary indoor bike. And then they also had a group that rode tandem bicycles. Now, if you're not familiar with a tandem bicycle, that means there's two of you. So somebody rides in front, somebody rides in back, and those chains are connected. So you're going the same speed. And so the person in front is actually kind of what we call a puller. And their idea is to keep you at a pace that you may not be otherwise able to do. Um, and so the, they did it both ways. Um, and they have come out with their guidelines on how we should run the program. So the goal for you when you're in the program is to be able to get to and to hold uh, 80 to 90 revolutions per minute for about 40 minutes of the exercise. So we do about a 10 minute warm up. We go for about 40 minutes of 80 to 90 RPMs. And then we have about a 10 minute cool down. Um, currently, the classes run with just uh, the indoor stationary bikes. Although, I will tell you that I am currently on the hunt uh, for, we're looking at bringing in tandem bicycles. Um, I actually already have some volunteers who are very willing to ride on the front of those bikes to help people be able to achieve what they're trying to do and, and be able to get to those RPMs. Um, so with somebody being able to help, so say that you can't by yourself do 80, 90 RPMs, uh, you could be able to, maybe you can do 60. That person would pull a little bit harder and help you get up to 65 or get up to 70 as we work through it and try to eventually get you up into that range. Um, and so we are working um, here in the community right now to be able to get the funding for those and get those in place so they would be in, the, in, in there as an option as well. Um, I met with our CEO, I think two weeks ago, to talk about this program and say, you know, how, how we thought the longevity of this program was going to look. And I went in hoping he would say, we can keep running this program for free at our central location, and I think we'll be able to find the money to get the bikes. And I walked out of there with him saying, we're going to run this program at all three facilities in Spokane, and I'll find you the money for all the bikes. So this program is, is not 
<laughs> is not going to disappear anytime soon here within our, our Ys. So it's something that we feel, um, if you're not familiar with this, um, we are uh, a nonprofit, and we feel like this is part of our role in the community is to be able to do things like this. So it's something that we felt was a great fit for us to be able to, to offer as well. Um, so we were looking to get a tandem bike. So if that's something that would be something where you felt you would need, um, that is definitely something that we are going to be providing here very shortly, uh, which I think will make a big difference because some people that we've had who have come to the program have not been able to achieve those kind of uh, that kind of pace. Uh, the majority, I will say, have and, and can, uh, but that's been one of the things that we have found have, have taken some people out of the class is just being able to withhold that uh, that pace on those bikes. Um, so we're just finishing this first session, and although we have not done our paperwork yet to see and really look at their pre-testing and post-testing uh, as of yet, uh, I will tell you that I just was meeting with the, the classes at 1.15 Monday, Wednesday, Friday here in Spokane. Uh, the one we have currently running, we're looking at getting some other ones going. But um, So I was just in there before I came over here today telling them that I was coming, which they all knew that I was going to be here, so uh, which is probably why they stayed there and didn't come here with me. So, um, but talking about the program, I mean, every single person in there will sit down and tell you that they have noticed small changes in in their symptoms of Parkinson's by going through this program. Um, I don't have a person in there who has done this entire 10-week program who says, oh, no, I just pedal, but no really change. They all have can tell me certain noticeable changes they have found in their symptoms of Parkinson's. Now, the research tries to that the study was done on claims up to 35% reduction in symptoms. He doesn't say how or what symptoms or anything like that. And I'm not going to go out. I'm not a doctor, and I'm not going to go out and say we'll guarantee 35% reduction of your symptoms. But the people who have gone through the program so far have definitely noticed changes, um, whether that is in the speed they're able to walk, um, whether that is in trimmers, although most of them um, have DBS, but um, but less trimmers, or they can speak faster, different things that they can all tell me, yeah, I've noticed a change in this, I've noticed a change in this area, I've noticed a change in that area. So when we hear things like that, it makes it something that we really, really want to continue to do because I think any time where you can notice a change like that in a positive manner, um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, when we met with Dr. Greeley, um, if any of you meet with Dr. Greeley or Dr. Aldred, um, I will tell you, because I've, I've met with them, that their number one first goal with treatment is exercise. And when I met with Dr. Greeley and said, here's the program and here's what it looks like, he goes, it's exercise. That's all I'm looking for. I don't care if they're doing 80, 90 RPMs. I don't care if they're doing 20 RPMs. People need to exercise, and that exercise will be a big benefit in their Parkinson's. So our goals are out there of what the, the program recommends and what we try to get to and all those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> but we really hope you take advantage and at least come by or have questions that if you think you may be able to do it. Um, we actually have somebody in the class that has built um, attachments for the handlebars because he didn't want to lean over so far because a, a normal bike is is kind of a lean over quite a ways. And so he made out of PVC. They're the coolest things ever. I, I'm ready to like sit down with him and patent these things because they. You know, I still think he could make a lot of money on these things. But they just clamp onto our handlebars and raise you up another two to four inches so that you can sit upright, which is a lot more comfortable, especially as we're don't, as we get older. And they, he, they, you can sit there and ride, but you can still reach the levers. He measured everything out. He built these things. They're, they're great. And they make a big difference to those who are in the class because they can actually reach and, and hold on and be in a position that's not hurting their back or something by leaning over all the time. Um, so when he came up with that, I thought it was brilliant because it's not something we had really thought of. We said, oh, we have spin bikes. We can run this program. Um, but it's, been, it's made a big change to it. Um, and currently our instructor, uh, her name is Jessica. Uh, she is a personal trainer. She is a group exercise instructor. And she also works with our uh, Live Strong at the YMCA, which is a cancer survivors program. So she's very used to working with demographics that aren't just the super fit kind of people. So she 
is very good at, at understanding modifications and things like that if we need to do things to make sure people can do uh, what we're trying to do and all those kind of things. Um, so in the Y system, there's probably five or six different Parkinson's programs that they recommend. Um, we've talked about and looked at some of the other ones. But so far, this one has been the one that we have really seen. Uh, I'll say I'll say we've chosen this for two reasons so far. One, we've seen success with it. And when talking to other Ys and other programs who run it, they've seen success with it. And number two, this is one of the only programs that is continual. So there's other Parkinson's programs out there that may go for 12 weeks. And then you're done with the program. Hit the microphone there. Uh, and, then, and then that's it. That your 12 weeks is done. Thank you, good job, congratulations, and you're on your way. Uh, this program, you can take as many times as you would like. Um, as far as we are concerned at the Y, you can come to this program for as long as you like. We're never going to charge you a dollar. You just let us know, and you can come. We do them in about 10 week sessions. Uh, we do ask for a commitment for those 10 weeks because we want you to be successful, number one. And we want the class to have some kind of continuity so that they know the people are going to be there as well. Um, right now, we have about eight or 10. Um, you're welcome to bring a support person. So a lot of people bring their spouses. Uh, I think today there was three spouses in there cycling with their, um, with their spouse in there when I, when I was in seeing class before I came over. So um, it's, you don't have to. There's many people in there who don't bring somebody. But you're welcome to bring a support person as well to that. Um, and the nice thing is, like I said, is that it's continual. So you can continue to do this program. You can keep going in this program. Um, and we don't, we're, not, we're never going to kick you out um, unless you just get too good or too fast or something. So, um, or they declare that you don't have bark. No, I'm just joking. We, we, we would let you in. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely something that, that we've really enjoyed um, and we've seen some great success in. And, and we're very um, interested in seeing continue here because I think a lot of people have started to see success from it. So. And I'll let Cindy come up and turn microphones on or whatever she does. All the fancy things. Yeah. Well, I think some of the best news that I just heard is what you said when you walked out of that meeting, that you went in hoping for to have some funds for some bikes and maybe just the one location, and he said all locations, and we're going to find money for bikes. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's turn on your mics at all of the... Uh, locations that are um, broadcast in. Um, Mary here, and we'll start in Spokane for just a second. Mary um, here in Spokane has a question. Uh, so the question was, do you have to be a Y member uh, to be part of the class? And the answer is no. Um, that's, there's, there's, uh, I know sometimes when people say free in commercials, there's gimmicks there, but I, there really isn't. Um, uh, if you want to use the Y outside of the class, then we can definitely talk about a membership. There's lots of options for, um, we have sliding scales depending on income. So if you're on a fixed income, if you have medical bills, those kind of things we take into account. Um, if you have silver sneakers, which is something through your insurance, um, but this crowd isn't old enough for Medicare, so that probably doesn't qualify. So, um, But silver sneakers is something that works there. <laughs> I got a ha, that works. Um, so there is, if you want to do other things in, in, in the Y, as far as doing other exercise, using the therapy pools, doing some water exercise, anything like that, that would you would need a membership for. But if you just want to come and participate in the program, you do not have to have a membership, and the program is, is free. So, Yes? Me? Sure. Okay. Uh, She's bringing a mic over for you. Um, is there a particular kind of bike that you use for this program, like the bikes they use in the spinning classes, or is this any of the kind of bikes, the recumbent bikes and the other stationary bikes that can be used for this program? We only use the spinning bikes, um, is, is the recommendation from them. We have looked at getting into recumbent bikes. Uh -huh. I know that would be a lot more comfortable for some people uh, if they can't sit. Yeah. And so we're looking – we've – we have talked about it. If somebody came and said that they, that's the only way they'd be able to do it, then we'd find a way to get one in there for them to be able to do. Um, so the number of revolutions you need to to achieve for the goal here, you can do on a regular stationary bike probably. It's just easier on a spinning bike, I would think. Um, 
Yeah, the so the spin bikes we use that are kind of like in the picture there, the resistance is done with a magnet. And so as that magnet gets closer, it adds more resistance. But it's an, it's an easier spinning um, wheel, whereas when you get into recumbent bikes, you're starting into a lot of belts and a lot of yes. other things that are going to possibly have a little bit difference. But it's not that there's a bad part to it um, or anything like that. Um, so there, you could do it on any bike. Um, as far as – I don't know that they've done research necessarily on a recumbent bike, but I wouldn't okay. see any difference so, on it. So basically you're saying this program is – the idea, the concept you've done so far has been with the spinning bikes, and so that's at least where you're starting. With. Okay. Thank yeah, you. but if somebody needed a recumbent bike or something else, I don't. There would not be a problem to that from from the cycling standpoint. It's still cycling. Okay, it looks like we're going to jump to the other sites for right now and go through and get some questions, but I see three people with their hands up here. Um, Anchorage, Alaska, did you have any questions for Eric today? And I'm going to go through pretty quick. And so if I go through. Yeah. Anchorage was having trouble with their audio earlier. They could hear us fine, but they were, were unable to speak. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, Anchorage, if you have questions, email me and I will get those questions to Eric. Same with all the sites. If there's any, if we missed you. Um, Billings, Montana. Hello. Hello. No, we have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I have uh, two questions. One is um, my understanding and reading the material uh, quite a while ago that one of the requirements to be successful was that the the pusher or whatever you call the person up front maintained a certain RPM and so it kind of forced the rider in the back to maintain a minimum RPM and that was part of the success of the program. You couldn't just get on and pedal at one mile an hour. They tried to sustain a minimum RPM. And so you'd want that person to know what they were doing. And if, you, if that's the case, do you have like a, some way that we could train, train the trainer or get somebody who knows what they're doing in the front of the bike rather than just your buddy? Right. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a very valid point. So the research does want 80, 90 RPMs. Um, like I said, if you've talked to some doctors, they just want exercise. But the research is based off of achieving 80 to 90 RPMs that whole time. Um, and I would say that for what we have found so far when we've been looking at volunteers to be that puller, um, although pusher may be better if they're <laughs> – depends on which way you think about cycling. But uh, um, is finding somebody who is – we've found some serious cyclists um, who really watch their RPMs and understand that. And you have to also understand that person, it, it may not be able to be just a friend that they have or a spouse because – they're going to have to be able to pedal that revel that right. that speed plus keeping those feet who are attached to their pedals basically also at that speed. So you're probably going to have to find some people who are in pretty good shape. Um, so far, what we've been looking at is people who are already cycling or looking at that cycling community to kind of find those people so far. I'm just going to make an assumption. Is that Grove? Are you that there? That was not even asked the question, but it's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> because I know somebody <laughs> sitting, if Grove's there, so he's sitting in the room, his cycling skills, he could probably be one of those people. I would love to help out with that. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, corollary question to that is, can we get something set up through the Croc Center maybe in Coeur d'Alene or through one of the health clubs here? Is there a resource kind of partner my, with you on that? My guess, I would, the Croc Center would probably be the first place I would talk to. I mean, that's where... I'd be happy. We've worked with them on stuff before. Um, so if they'd be willing to do that, we could definitely have reach out to that. I'd be happy to help work on that one with you. That'd be great. Yeah. Kind of, again, to, uh, to piggyback that part really quick, for any of the cities that um, we broadcast to, if they have a Y in the city, the Y is has a relationship with pedaling for Parkinson's. Is that right? Yes. So – there is a possibility if it works out that any Y could sign up for a pedaling for Parkinson's. They just have to find somebody willing to work on it like you do and get the program going. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Sorry to cut you off. Did you have one more question? One more. Uh, when you have a Nordic track uh, recumbent uh, exercise bike, it has miles per hour and resistance. 
I wonder what would be equivalent to the 80 or 90, the speed uh, and also resistance that you can set. That's a good question. <laughs> Without having a cadence uh, thing on it, um, it, I don't know that I can give you an answer on the exact resistance and speed that we'll be able to pull that off the top of my head, uh, if you can even measure it that way. Uh, we can go the old school route that we do with when we teach kids, which is basically you put your hand where your knee's going to tap it, and uh, it's full revolution. So if that knee should hit your hand, uh, so you're looking at you know, 40, 45 times there, time yourself for a minute and kind of see what that cadence is like just to try to check in with, on yourself. But I don't know that I can give you an answer on a speed versus level of resistance that will necessarily equate to that off the top of my head without being on that piece and testing it out or something. No, I'm presently trying to do uh, a mile in uh, six minutes. So it will depend on what your uh, resistance is at, whether or not how fast that is. Um, <laughs> one, yeah. <laughs> Then you're probably if you're if yeah if you're at a pretty low resistance as far as easy and you're doing it pretty quick then you're most likely pretty close to that kind of speed. Um, 80 90 RPMs is is not uh, a nice little bike ride down the uh, path along the, the lake out there or anything. But yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Cordelaine, um, I forgot to ask uh, the previous sites. How many people do you have today? We have 10. Thank you. OK. Um, Billings, how many people did you have today? We have two. Thank, Thank you. you, Billings. OK, Colfax. Yes. Hi there. Do you have any questions and how many people today? We have just two people and no questions today. So far. <laughs> so <Thank> far. <laughs> <laughs> Colville, uh, Providence, Mount Carmel. Do we have any guests there today? Lewiston, um, let's see, Lewiston, uh, Clarkston area. Do we have any attendees there today? They moved locations, so they might they have two? Okay. Well, they. we have to also thank, is it St. Joe's that they're at today? Um, sometimes, you know, things happen and we get moved around and we have to put a thank you out there to St. Joseph's down um, in Lewiston for giving us an extra site while our old normal site is being um, upgraded and other things going on. So thank you to them. Uh, Moses Lake, do we have guests there today? Mo Yes, Moses Lake has 17. Yeah. Huh? And we do have questions. Okay. We're ready. I have a question. We don't have a Y here, uh, but we have a, a large athletic club. Um, are you available, Eric, to help if they want to start a program? I am happy to have that conversation. Um, it, it, dep yeah, it depends on the community. Sometimes. Athletic clubs are interested in this kind of stuff, and sometimes you have to kind of stay at the nonprofit level who have more of interest in that. But yeah, I'm definitely I'm open to have helping that conversation whenever I can. Oh, thank you, uh, Sandy. Do you have a question? Yeah, in the uh, research and effort, is there any effort to um, measure the, or assess the level of uh, stage of what stage of Parkinson's the people are that are participating? As an example, there's a lot of difference between early Parkinson's and advanced. Yeah, I've never seen anything in the research, um, but that is a great question. I know we've had some of those conversations just internally, but I've never seen anything in the research on that. Um, but I may check back, because uh, the doctor who did the original research I know is always continuing stuff, and that may be something I can ask him. They just may not have put it in the research. That's currently running? Yeah. 
I, I just asked if he knew an approximate age, ra age range. I'm putting him on the spot. So, because um, I know a few people, I would say that they're all above 60, except for maybe one. I have, I, know I think, one or two under 60, probably. So it's not just a young person get on the bike with Parkinson's. It's a, there's other levels. Yes. Okay. But you said most of them have had the deep brain implant? Um, the majority of them from, um, from conversations I had, they were, had had uh, DBSN, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, ha I know I have a couple that for sure that did not. Um, but, yeah, most of them are not early, early Parkinson's. Most of them have, have had it for a while now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you have uh, any more questions? Other questions? No, I don't think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. It looks like Othello might have logged in. Do we have anybody in the Othello today? Give it a second. Um, next is Pendleton, uh, Pendleton Public Library. Do we have guests there today? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> and how many do you have today? We have four, four, and we have a testimonial, and we also have a question. We love testimonials. Go for it. Hey, I'm Charlie Klepney, and my wife has diagnosed Parkinson's for seven years. Last year, we rode the RAGBRAI rag with the Cleveland Institute's team. Uh -huh. uh, she was one of seven people. Uh, when you said puller, you meant a captain. And I was the captain on the tandem, and she was the stoker. Uh, I can tell you uh, as a testimonial that she hasn't done this program, but we raised money for it. Um, and we did the 416 miles across Iowa. Um, yes, I was in front, but you've got to remember this lady was my wife, so I was the captain and she was the admiral. Um, <laughs> that is, that is more. It gets a, a clap. I want to let you know that we rode with Nan, Nan Little. So they came to our house here about two months ago because they live in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And um, Nan, both my wife and I are going to ride again. I'm wearing the Pedaling for Parkinson's t-shirt today. Um, it's, it was a marvelous experience. I know that my wife got Jay's program. That's the doctor you're talking about. Yep. And she worked that. She rode about 750 miles on a stationary bike. And we did the tandem rides. The longest practice ride we did was about 47 miles. Wow. Um, we got the rate up to where we were doing uh, a 65 mile day in about seven and a half hours. But realize that the rag bri is a foodie. Mm -hmm. So every 10 miles, we were stopping and having a piece of pie or, yeah. or something. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it, it's an amazing experience. We're gonna do it again. This year's ride is uh, 462 miles. We started Sioux City, Iowa. Dip our back tire in the Missouri River and right across through Fort Dodge, Cedar Falls, down to Davenport, and we'll put our front tire in. So we're going to do it again. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh, for and that. I might, I might, I might add. You know, when she gets off that bike, she can write better. She can walk better. She's got better balance. There is something about riding a bicycle that mitigates the effects of the medication that she's taking. And she feels a lot better about things, too. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I, we want to hear. I have a question. OK, um, I'm going to try to attempt to contact our athletic club here in Pendleton. Um, where did you get your um, funding or grants or whatever for your stationary or your, for your tandem bikes? We got stationary, but not tandem. We, we don't yet. We, we don't have the funding as of yet. Um, I know here uh, we're actually have reached out to um, a lot of the medical community. So we've, we're in conversations with Providence and INHS and Rockwood and, and some of those groups to say, hey, you know, we're going to run this program. That's our place in the community. But we think everybody should get a little skin in the game. So that's where we've started. Um, 
Like I said, that conversation was only about two weeks ago, and I know that our CEO already told me he reached out and at least put the feelers out. Um, but we haven't, we have not gotten any grants or gone that route yet. Um, so I, when I, if I get better answers on that, as far as if we find some grants that apply to this, um, especially for some smaller communities, I will definitely let you know um, and pass that information out. But at this point, we're we're kind of just starting within our our medical community here to see if they'd be willing to kind of help us get that going. Yeah, well, that's that's really neat. Uh, just save all your pop cans and send them down to Oregon, and I'll turn them Hi. in. <laughs> Hi, Sue. Hi. <laughs> we love that you save your pop cans. You're awesome. Um, and uh, I wrote a grant a year and a half ago for tandem bikes and unfortunately didn't get it. But one thing that happens around this time of year and in the fall, and it probably it depends on the um, quality of the bike and things, but this is the time of year when people are doing bike swaps and switching out and things. If you know somebody has a tandem that they want to possibly um, not be an owner of anymore, never hurts to ask them to see if they want to donate it towards these programs. One of these is a newer program, so grants in some in, are a little bit harder at times to get funds for a newer program. That's why they've been doing what they've been doing for the couple cycles to get some information and uh, statistics behind it. Thank you very much for those questions and the testimonial. Yeah. And we want to see more, hear more about your ride when you do it. Uh, let's see, Port Townsend. Pullman? Do we have guests at Pullman there today? Are, uh, Pullman, there are five of us here today, two have left. Uh, I'm asked to give you congratulations on a nice program, and I have a question. Okay. Uh, what I call dizziness is a prominent feature for me, for the Parkinson's. I have managed to fall off two regular bicycles and Fought twice fall off, and I also fell off several times off the recumbent. Do any of these things come with straps so that you don't fall off? <laughs> Sorry. Um, are you talking like an outdoor bike, or are you talking like an indoor stationary no. bike? At, at the gym. Okay. Indoor stationary bikes. Um, I've... I do just need it a while, and then it, yeah. it comes apart. I could see a way that a recumbent, you could put a strap on it pretty easily, but I don't know that I could say I've ever seen one. Uh, okay. But I, I, you could put something like a seatbelt on there pretty easily, in my opinion, but yeah, well, I've never I seen one. I have seen two, but I just wondered if they came with them. Not that I've ever seen. No, but you might have to get the gentleman from your class to see what he can That's come right. up with. So maybe we'll... If you want it made out of PVC, I think I know somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Tenasket, uh, North Valley Hospital. Hi, we have three today and a couple of questions. Um, you said that the class goes for 10 weeks. How many times a week? Uh, three Just days a week. a week. Three days, maybe I did. Three days a week. And that's, Thank yeah, they actually have their recommendations. You can be anywhere between, I think, like eight and 12 mm -hmm. weeks on the actual length yeah. of the program. We have gone with 10 because it seems to fit in between some things like holidays and things like that easier. Um, but, and it was, we didn't want to go 12 weeks because so that's a longer commitment for people to commit to that whole program. But the important part is that people are doing it three days a week. Um, I, my, I have something for my mountain bike that it's like a stand it sits in mm -hmm. and then I can use it as an exercise bike and I yeah. can get the, um, um, Whatever, how fat, what is it, the RCMs? No, RPMs. I RPMs? Yeah. And I just wonder if a tandem bike could do that too. I mean, it would be better better than if you don't have a place to go. That's exactly what we will do with the tandem bikes when we have them, is we will put them oh, on a trainer mean, like that and ride them indoors. Okay. So they're going to be real bikes that you could ride around, but you're going right. to do it. Okay. Yeah. So you could fix up your bicycle yourself yeah. if you had one of those. Yeah. Correct. You could okay. you could you could put a bike on a trainer, um, is what they call it, right. whatever, and then right. they could they could ride that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we're we're hoping to get to the place that we can actually do an outdoor ride eventually with people. Um, but I have some dreamers at the Y who want to do one this summer. I said that might be pushing it, but um, but we'll see. That's the goal is to eventually do one outside. But right now we're just trying to get 
everybody up and going on even indoors for now. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Walla Walla. Miss Walla Walla, there are four of us today. Do you have a question? Welcome. Uh, Thank you. I've been, I, I, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I've been riding as a cardiac rehab patient, bikes and treadmills and recumbents and for 10 years. Discovered about four or five years ago that I have Parkinson's and continue to do this riding as a part, part of an exercise routine. Mm -hmm. I presume the stationary bike gives you the ability to be constant where an outdoor riding on a road bike, you're, you're varying your speed all the time. That would but be as long as, as long as you're exercising is good. Correct. Yeah, I'm, yeah, and that's, yeah, when we go outdoors a lot of places, it's harder to stay consistent. Um, you know, there's a few trails around. Um, now, I'm from Walla Walla. You've got lots of fields you can go ride out and around. But, um, but a lot of places, yeah, it's hard to stay consistent for 40 minutes or so outside. Thank you. Yeah. And did we have any questions left in Spokane? So I, I'll go here, there, and there. Yeah, well, I sort of have an observation. I, I'm yeah. riding a, a, a recumbent bike mm -hmm. uh, at, at the, the place we live, at Fairwood. Mm -hmm. And what I notice is if you increase the, the tension, then uh, you, go, you, you cover more miles mm -hmm. in the same period. So it's going to be like shifting to a higher gear. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I, yeah, but, but I can only... I can only uh, uh, pedal at about 45 RPMs at a level of six. Mm -hmm. and, and then when I get off the bike, uh, I'm pooped. Mm -hmm. And I will say that when we, the f first couple times people come, they come out of class, they don't usually even say hi to me. They, there's not much going on there anymore. I mean, it, you may not make it that even full hour. Sorry, it's, it, it takes a little while to kind of get used to it. Well, so we have a 10 minute warm up and a 10 minute cool down, then we, 40 minutes in the middle is where we're trying to maintain that that piece. So that's the eventual yeah, goal. But I, yeah. I do half an hour uh, at a yeah. stretch, about yeah. five or six days. Ago. And that's great. Wow. Yeah. Okay. How, how soon do you expect to open up this program in the north north way? As soon as I have enough interest to make it run. So um, if you. If I have business cards or I have flyers on the program here with me too. So if you're here in Spokane or if not, if you have questions, but um, the sooner I get you on interest list and the sooner, as soon as I have enough people to make a class run, um, we'll make that happen. That's, we're definitely in for it. It's just a matter of, of having enough people, you know, I don't think you really want one-on-one. -on -one. They, then they pick on you more, but uh, no, it's nice. You know, we, I think we started when we started at central, we probably had five or six kind of consistence. Um, now we the, like the ten week commitment right now is somewhere between about eight and ten people, um, and if we're in those kind of numbers, that's pretty good for this community for size wise. So, but oh, we have twenty, little over twenty bikes per facility. So yeah, we could be holding quite a few people if we, and I'll buy more bikes if that's just the problem. <laughs> Through the years in trying to pursue fitness, I've tried various types of equipment, including some of the bicycles, and after a while, my hip will start hurting and I end up giving up. Is there a way, does that mean if that happens that this program isn't going to work, or is there a way that you can help get through it so it doesn't cause an enduring problem? Most likely that's a strengthening thing um, or some kind of, so normally that's something we try to work with, um, and so let us know where it is. If it's something we can help, we help. Sometimes I tell people they need to go see like a physical therapist because sometimes it might be something that's just a little bit different. They need to kind of work that piece out. Um, sometimes it is something we take a break and something just got aggravated. So that's why we try not to start and go too much too soon, um, which usually is what starts those. But we try to work through those as much as we can and, and do what we can. But I've had some people who have had some hip problems that were able to either do some better stretching or do some things to really help that or sometimes it's positioning on the bike. So we really try to make sure we fit you to the bike properly because if we get in that bike in the wrong position, that can mess up our hips and stuff too. So hopefully it would just be something like that. Mm -hmm. 
so can people just drop in or do they have to sign up and then they're on for 10 weeks and when does it start when's your next one so our next program and i have a bunch of flyers here for those of you here in spokane but our next program here starts march 23rd so that's two weeks from today um and yes you're welcome to come by um if you're going to come by this week class is still running wednesday and friday uh 115 to 215 um and uh if you're wanting to come the week in between double check with me and make sure because we're talking about either taking that week fully off or making that week kind of a week you can kind of come in if you want to come check it out kind of thing so if you're going to come in i can at least make sure the instructor's there and stuff to meet her and things like that but some of the cyclists may take that week off to kind of before they talking about you the week before the 23rd yeah so we could uh, about 16 16 like through the 20th yeah so if you're going to come in that week let me know but otherwise we're well we're there yeah so this week the program's still going so if you if you can swing by wednesday or friday um we're we'll be there okay yeah i think that was a lot of good questions there was some great questions and um Hello, this is Miles CD. Oh, thank you, uh, Miles. Forgive, forgive, forgive us for forgive us for interrupting, but you missed us in the round robin, and also we oh, missed yes, the, most of the present. We missed most of the presentation because of technical problems. But oh, we I... do have ten people here, okay. and uh, we just thank you for putting this on for us. And we will have a copy of this. Uh, so that we can send it to you, and we are in the process of uploading all of our past programs onto the YouTube as well, so you should be able to see this. But I can send out a DVD if you have anybody who would like to watch it later. Um, and I'm sorry for missing you, and I'm sorry about the technical problems, but we're glad to have you there. Well, thank you very much. I know. How do you do it? So a lot of a lot of the water from cool down is like, it's uh it's just that we get our body warm. We don't go to 90 RPM. So we get on, we kind of get in there. There's some stretching that will happen, um, things like that. But we'll just kind of do some little warm ups, pedal at a much slower pace, and just kind of work ourselves up there so that. Our body is warm, our muscles are warm, we're ready to try to kind of go for that for 40 minutes. And the same kind of thing with cool down. A lot of cool down is just kind of slowing that pace back down, getting our heart rate back down, doing some stretching on and off the bike both ways to kind of make sure at the end. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're done for that part. Thank you so much for your time. And um, Eric does have the flyers here. It's going to be on our calendars. Um, and we'll make sure we have the information um, and maybe even help that we can get them to do some uh, oh, examples of it at the summit that coming up in September have some bikes there and we can have people get on and kind of see what it's like. Um, but uh, yeah, don't hesitate to either call me um, at the PRC about it or call Eric and his contact information is down here at the bottom of the screen and um, he, he he's the health and wellness director for the whole Y clinic that he's at so he's a busy guy so give him a little bit to contact you back but he always does so um now give me about two minutes um and those of you who want to stay to talk and uh, listen about the toolkit please stay um and uh, unless you're really tired and i can move that back to another day and I'm going off of the Spokane crowd. Would you like to just go through the toolkit really quick? Yeah. Okay. So give me about two minutes to just turn over the screen. And um, everybody, I'd like to give a hand of applause for Eric and thank him very much for coming today.
So, nope, and mine's not on that, so you can go ahead and exit out of that one for him. Nope. Nope, I just have a PDF. I can pull that up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but he is the orange one, yep. Cool. And it's just finding, there it is, okay. Got it. The magnet, I have no idea. On, on the spin bikes? Yeah. I don't know. You could go up and look at it. There's a whole room full of yellow spin bikes. There's probably... Do you have to stay away from magnets? Well, if you stick it. Moses Lake, could you do me a favor and uh, mute your microphone? I'm sorry. That's okay. No, don't be sorry, Moses Lake. For those sticking around, we're going to start in about a minute. Thank you, Cindy. On a regular bike, that's... September 12th. September 12th. The, the summit is Saturday, September 12th. It'll go from uh, registration and check-in. Well, I know that I'm on. I just wanted to let you know if people have this question. But um, the summit, uh, it'll check-in starts at about 8.30, and it'll go from 9 until 4. And then there's the, but, but September 12th is the date. We're going to do a fundraiser on the 11th, the Shaken But Not Stirred. We're going to do that the night before. And then a support group leader training the day of the 11th. So, yeah. <laughs> She's crazy. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and have a seat. So this part right here is going to, I was going to say it's going to get a little personal, but it's not really personal. Why again is Cindy doing a presentation? Well, in the time that I've known many of you, I have now experienced at least six visits to the hospital with my father um, in the last two and a half years. And um, there's just certain things you learn and what we were I'm a, by no means I'm not a nurse. I, I'm not a doctor. I don't have, I, I don't even have a social working certificate or degree. Um, just been, been around for a while and kind of been in the social work role off and on in my different jobs. But um, so after the last time in February, well, actually, yeah, oh my gosh, it is March. That's what happens, see? Um, the last telehealth I ran in here in between dropping my dad off and getting him checked into the ER and driving over here and then going back and spending the rest of the day with him and then getting him into the hospital. So um, I am a 42-year-old daughter of an 82-year-old dad who is uh, a widow. Um, I am the only child who lives in Spokane. Um, so you come across some interesting experiences when that happens. 
Um, but everything that I'm going to tell you pretty quick, you can ask me later, but everything I'm going to tell you pretty quick um, works for a couple who is married, um, who if you choose somebody to be your uh, person, your advocate, this can all work that way if you get the things set up right for all of those situations. But um, so really quick, I have a list and this is your toolkit or what I think should be your toolkit. Um, starting at the top, <coughs> copies of your medication list. I talk about lots of things that you can do as gifts for your children. One of the things that you can have as a gift for your children is actually this toolkit. But if you go in and everybody does their, tool, their uh, medication lists differently. Um, maybe you have a phone where you do yours. Maybe you have a, um, you get on Excel and do it. Maybe you're old school like me and my dad and we write it down on a piece of paper. But so let's say my dad calls me on the weekend and says, I don't feel very good. Okay, and I go out and check on him and he's doing okay. And the next day I go out and check on him, he's doing okay. And Monday morning he calls me and he says, I don't feel very good. And that's what I mean by those unplanned visits. But um, what uh, we decide and we call his doctor um, and the doctor says, we're not sure what it is, get him into the hospital now. Do you think it's a blood clot? We don't know. If you think he's got any symptoms of a blood clot, call the ambulance. Well, we didn't think it was a blood clot, so we were okay. So I drove him down to the hospital. Um, first thing that's not on that little list that I showed you, if you have something happen over a weekend and you're going to go into the hospital with your loved one or your friend, try to get to the hospital before 1130 on Monday morning. Because after 1130 on Monday morning, everybody who gets off work at lunch who's either gotten hurt or had something going on on the weekend, they all come to the ER at 12, or at 12 o'clock. So if you can get there, it just lowers the amount of stress and wait time. Um, so if you know something is going on and you can, yes, of course, it's an emergency and it's not planned, but if you can get into the hospital, uh, to the ER before 11.30 in the morning, especially on a Monday, it's helpful just to get you through that process because often that whole process might take all the way until eight o'clock that night or later. So um, that's the first, that is part of the toolkit. Just keep in mind if you're gonna go in timing wise, if you get any say. Now on the other side of it, if you're unfortunately getting pulled in by an ambulance, you get right in and then that, well, that part doesn't really um, apply to yours. But so medication list, um, in the emergency room, you're going to get questions there. You're going to hear them ask questions. What happened? Do you know what day it is today? What is your pain level? Has this happened before? Do you have any pre-existing conditions? These are all questions that you should have for me. I should have all those questions answered by my dad. I'm not going to sit there in the emergency room and answer those questions for him, but I'm going to be there when he's not sure because he's in a confusing situation and he's going to look at me and go, and I go, yep, dad, you have a pig valve. And he goes, oh yeah, that's right. I got a pig valve. Okay. So, um, but, uh, you're going to get asked all those questions and then they're going to say, what medications are you on? And you're in an emergency room and you're sitting there thinking, and I, I, I don't know what he took cause I don't necessarily know if he took them before I got there. He's not feeling very well and hopefully he took everything, but you want to make sure that you have some type of paper medication list. And each time you update it, <laughs> each time you update it, make a new copy of it. Spend a couple extra cents and make copies of it. Write it out or have them write it out. Be, and don't just take one copy of it. They will make copies for you, but make it easier on your ER staff, your nurses and things. Have an extra copy. Take two or three in your kit. So I have, this is our version of it. Um, that I changed over a little bit from our PD-101. These are blank copies. You can have as many of these as you want. You let me know if you want more, I'll get them to you. I wanna make this part as easy as possible. But this is write down every single thing that you take, how many times you take it, and what you take it for. And then for us Parkinson's community members, my father-in-law is Parkinson's, 
don't be afraid to write across the top, I have Parkinson's. That's just a helpful because they're going to do at the hospital, they're going to do everything they can to keep you on your medications, on your schedule. But if, you know, all the other things going on, my dad didn't, my dad doesn't have Parkinson's, but he didn't go in for, they thought it was a blood clot. Well, it was something completely different. And so as you're looking through things, sometimes Parkinson's or congestive heart failure or whatever it is can get overlooked. So take your medication list, two or three copies with you. Um, ID bracelets are awesome and they're kind of pretty if you want them to be. You can get many different kinds, but when you, the experiences I have now had, every single nurse who saw my dad's ID bracelet said, that's really cool because I have, so if you, to jump back for a second, there's a kit that you can get through the National Parkinson's um, foundation and it's called Aware in Care and you can go to a website called www.awareincare.org and you can get this kit and it has a lot of the things I'm talking about here but I added a couple more. One of the things you get is this bracelet if you want to wear it and, but all this bracelet has is I have it says Parkinson's disease alert. So not everybody, hopefully you have Parkinson's and you're, that's it. But like I use my dad as an example, he has a pig valve, he's on Coumadin. So what we do is we went and we got a bracelet and I never thought he was going to wear it and I gave it to him for Christmas and I came out three weeks after I gave it to him and he had it on and he's like, this is kind of cool, it's yellow, I like it. And I was like, cool, okay. But um, this is an example. You can get them done where you can have them printed out with different things. You have different medical ID bracelets. But this is the one that I recommend. And remember, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I don't make any money off of this. Um, but these are interchangeable. You can pick a cause. You can do it in any color you want. You can do it clear. But what happens is you put down your name. You put down where you're from. You put down contact number. You put your uh, emergency contact. And then you can put down, uh, I have no allergies, I have Parkinson's. And then what's also really cool is you can put different things on there like believe or never give up. But the information is on here when you have it. It's they, and they didn't take it off my dad the whole time he was in the hospital. They worked around it, which was pretty wonderful. Um, they also, this version, this company, Road ID, which is a pretty cool company, they've created these bands so that um, a first responder knows what's going on, um, that it is a medical ID bracelet. But they also have one that will um, connect to the internet. If they put in a certain number, the, the first responders, it'll connect right to the internet and it'll show the information that you put on there. So another cool thing. Um, so this kit has the medication woo, list. Um, it has a... I have Parkinson's aware the, and awareness um, piece of paper as information about Parkinson's. It also has a thank you card for when you're all done and you can thank your nursing staff um, and a couple other things. But what it doesn't have is it doesn't have a place to put a contact list for your family. So when you're a child or a friend of somebody who has somebody in the hospital, uh, it's good to know who they want contacted. Um, my dad will maybe three days in go, did you contact Danny? That's my brother. Did you contact Mike? I'm like, no, I didn't. Of course I did. You're in the hospital, dad. But which relatives, which doctors? So a contact list of family, caregivers, if they have home care of some kind, like a Gentiva or a family first, Doctor information. Um, if you're lucky enough to go to the doc to the hospital that's connected to your clinic or your doctors, it'll be in there. But it's good to have your neurologist information, your internal medicine information, your primary doctor's information. It's good to just have all that there. Again, you're just giving yourself and your child or your caregiver a gift in having that information. Um, that way, nobody's having to look it up in their phone or whatever while you're sitting there. Next part of your kit is patience. Um, patience with yourself, 
patience with um, with the process that's going on. Uh, patience with your family member. There's a lot of things going on, and a lot. There's many people in the ER at the same time, and it can be a confusing process. And it's really easy to get stressed out. And it's good to just take some time. They pull out your family member to go do tests. Um, you can most ERs you can go in and out. Take some time to sit down and breathe, because it's hard. You don't want to be in the ER. They don't want to be on e in the ER. A lot of the nurses are great about being in the ER, but they don't want to be in the ER either sometimes. So the next uh, part is a small notebook um, or a smartphone if you're comfortable with that. Because it's inevitable you or your parent or your spouse are going to have a question. And you don't see the doctor. You will see the doctor in the ER He'll run in, he'll check some things, he'll talk to you for a second, and he runs out to help the next person. And you go, oh my gosh, I wanted to ask him this. Well, just again, it's just write things down. The other reason that you have a notebook is write down your nurses' names. Write down the people that you see. Because they're the ones taking care of you. And you know what? It feels really good. And I'm not just saying this because you guys are here. I already had this planned. We have the WSU nursing uh, community with us today. But if you say walk into the room and you go, hi, Alice, thank you so much for being here. Or, Alice, oh, I'll get out of your way. Or Alice, didn't I see you six months ago? Or whatever <laughs> it is. It's just a really good way. Um, they're there working really hard and they have 10, 12 hour shifts. And to have somebody just remember their name or take a little time. So I like to write down the names. And then when you get up to the actual hospital floor, they're probably rotating. You might see the same nurse throughout the time. My dad was there for a week, and we were very lucky that he had um, nurses a couple times in the very beginning. But after the fourth day, he had a different nurse every single time. So it's just nice again. And then I walked out of his room one day, and there was Cindy. My name is Cindy. There was Cindy. I was like, Cindy! I saw you eight months ago <laughs> and she was like oh yeah and just builds again a, a place that's comfortable and it shows you appreciate them when they're working really hard um, and so I write use it for writing down questions uh, making notes to the nurse I try not to do too many of those and writing down the names of the people that I meet there in the hospital um, so as a child of a widowed person being the only person in town, if I go to the ER, they're pretty relaxed. They'll talk to pretty much anybody in the room because you're in the room and they don't go, that person shouldn't be there. If they don't say that, then it's pretty okay. They'll talk to you. Once you get up to the hospital room, you've checked in and you try and come back in. And you're up there on the eighth floor. Where's my dad? Because they took him up while you went and had a break. And you're like, what room is he in? And you get in there, and they're doing the med list again. And they're, how's your pain? And how's this? All this process goes through. And you're this person sitting there in the room. And they kind of just keep looking at you. And you're like, hi, I'm the daughter. And they're like, OK. And then you come back in the next day. And hi, I'm the daughter. Can you tell me what his test results were? Nope. Nope, I cannot tell you what your dad's test results were. I have durable power of attorney for health and uh, property. Can you tell me if I bring you a copy? Yes. So the next thing in your kit that you're going to have, you're going to have at least two or three copies of your durable power of attorney. Hopefully, it's already on file, because like Rockwood, you can put that in to your, into your file, and you have your dad or your mom or your sister, whoever it is you're helping take care of, they can sign a piece of paper that says they can talk to you. But um, have copies and a full copy of the actual durable, pa you know, you can see the names. I won't leave it up very long. But you want an actual copy of this, and you want to be able to just, they will make copies for you, but again, make life as easy as possible for your nurse as you can, and hand them over this copy, um, and they will put it in your file. Now, hopefully that stays in your file all the way through, and it'll get inputted input into the computer, but don't guarantee on it. Bring one every time. And sometimes you'll have new 
caregivers in the hospital who haven't met you and something happened to that copy and they won't talk to you, have another copy. And just say, oh, you know what? Something must have happened. The other one must not have made it in. Here's my other copy. And then hopefully they will share as much information with you as you can. Um, copies of living directive, healthcare directives. Um, this comes in a couple different forms. This is the legal version. Well, you all know it's I'm talking about my dad. So that's this is the legal version that my dad did with his will in his uh, uh, durable power of attorney. But um, you can this works as a healthcare directive. Um, what this also has is this on the second page. It talks about do I want to be resuscitated? What kind of care do I want? Do I want a feeding tube? Hopefully you're never going to need that. We didn't need that at this one, but it's there on file in case something happens so that the, doc the hospital, the nurses, the doctors can follow your, what your, um, like my father wants when he's in the hospital in case something's happening. Um, and just on a side note, just because you turn all this in does not mean you're going to die. I, okay. <laughs> Some people, it's just, if you get it in there, it's like, oh, but if I talk about it, something bad's going to happen. Something bad may happen anyway, so why not be prepared? Um, so this, there's also, um, a, they, they call them a couple different things, but there's a green sheet that you can put on your refrigerator at home. That works as a copy, and I can't, uh, DNR, a post, thank you, yay. Um, you can have a post, a DNR, or this. But have copies of these again with you. Um, an extra phone charger and plug in. It's, you know, now that we're so hooked to our smartphones. And make sure that you have the one that's for, um, if you can, have a plug in and then have one for his phone and one for your phone. We, I, he has a five, I have a six, so they're different or whatever it is. So they're different plugins. But it's, um, it's a way to communicate with the family. It's one less thing for stress. If you do end up getting to be in the hospital all day and part of that process, you have your phone charger there. You don't have to try and find a way to go get that done. And, and it's something to read your book while you're having patience and relax, you're having, building your patience and relaxing. Um, okay, where did it go? I'm almost done, you guys, I promise. Um, go back to the toolkit. There, this thing. I'll get that out of the way. I don't know if all hospitals have this, but I know where we went the other day. The nurses had at least one phone, if not two, and sometimes three phones. What they do is they have a phone number for each floor, and you can call that number and tell them who your spouse, father, sibling is. Say, I would like to ask some questions about it, and they will hook you through to your nurse, if, or his nurse. If um, they're not available, you can leave a message with somebody and they'll get back to you. So um, again, the nurses are there 10 hours, 12 hours, sometimes double shifts. They have a lot of things going on. And in each hour, depending on how that hospital works, they have three, four, or five patients that are under their care. And in most hospitals, they're trying to get to that patient a certain amount of time every hour and then through the night they have a certain amount of time so it's really hard to get any questions answered if they're trying to see five people for 15 minutes and something goes on a bedpan spills off the thing and they're cleaning that up or somebody gets sick or somebody new gets brought in and they're checking in another patient it's hard to ask questions when your nurse is in the room but it's really nice if you can if you leave and you can call and let them call you back when they have the time um, and they will call you back sometimes it takes a little while but if there's if it's not a life-threatening situation that your family members in or your whoever you're taking care of um, is in the hospital if you can wait to um, call and they will absolutely answer questions while you're there but if they are busy and you can tell and you can wait to call in um, you can also give that phone number to family members I caution a little bit about giving that phone number to family members because you just want to make sure that they know don't take up a half an hour of the nurse's time. The nurse has four, three, four, or five other patients that they're working with. 
So yes, call in and ask questions, but if you really have questions, have them all go through one person. Like your sister who's there in the hospital with him. Um, but it's also a really good way because I don't know about you, I don't get up at seven o'clock in the morning and down to the hospital by the, when the doctor is doing his rounds and they for, are forever there at seven o'clock in the morning. And I just spent the whole day getting my dad into ER and they're wonderful, but I can't make it down there at seven o'clock in the morning. And then they come back around sometime between two and four and I never seem to catch up with him. That phone number is a really good way to also ask your nurse any updates about um, your loved one. So just keep that in mind. You put that number in your notebook and you have it. Um, when you get, uh, when you uh, go into the hospital often, and this has been the case every time I've come in, they give you a form either from your insurance or Medicare that says um, if you feel like you are being uh, leaving the hospital sooner than you are ready, please let contact this who is on this list. Keep that paper with you. Um, they're, they're not generally going to let you go before you're done healing with whatever process, but sometimes you might feel that after a week there's still something going on and you want to check. Do not be afraid to ask the doctor for a re-evaluation of your patient family member. Um, they might say, nope, okay, you know, everything looks good, they're improving, we're good. And then you can say, well, how about home care? How about this? How about that? In that process. Um, but other times, if, if you have a valid, and it, all of the reasons are valid, I want to be careful how I say that, but if you have a valid reason, like, like my dad, he lives at home, and my dad at this time, he cannot walk from here to here without falling. Can you reevaluate to see if he can stay in longer? And if it's not longer, can you help us with other steps? And so that's what they do. And they, you know, as long as you're asking and bringing it up, it's a, uh, generally it goes the way it needs to go. Um, and so keep that form with you and hopefully you never need it. Um, and then the last, uh, in this kit, and you know what? Get something like this. Again, you can get this aware and care. Get something that can fit your copy of your durable power of attorney, about eight pages, several copies of it, health care directive, um, your little notepad things. Get something that can be kept by the door, or if you're really ahead of the game, you have a kit and your parents have a kit, and then you don't have to worry about it because then they can just keep it. I can keep the kit with me, and I do. I have all of it with me now. After six times, I finally learned. Um, but rest. And rest is a really important piece to put into that kit. Um, I Again, for me, I'm the only one that lives in town. So if my dad's in the hospital seven days a week, I'm going to try and get down there and visit him every day. I'm going to try and get down there at least a couple hours every day, if not more. Maybe go before work and after or whatever. It's exhausting. It's exhausting for you. And it's exhausting at times for the person who's in the hospital. Because I don't know about you, but when you go to visit somebody in the hospital, if you go in and they're not fearing, feeling very well, but they see that they're there, you're there, they don't want to fall asleep. So their rest is possibly also getting interrupted. So take some time for yourself. And at the same time, hey, dad, it's okay. I'm going to leave for a little bit. Go ahead and rest. And like my dad is one of those people who needs people to say that to him. He will think he needs to stay up the whole time you're in the room with him. And that's exhausting. So the last, even if you have to write it down, write it down on a piece of paper and as you go through your kit, rest. Get some rest because the people in the hospital are there to take care of them. That's, that doesn't get to be your primary job during that time. It's just being there to, as a support. So I'm done. My dad's calling me. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> um, 
I, you know so I do not know that yet. I imagine ov uh, over a certain period of time there is. We've been doing this for two and a half years now, and I haven't had a request. Yeah, um, no, I wouldn't think in two and a half, but yeah. I'm thinking in ten they might. Have. They might. Does anybody else know? I'm just curious because I'm wondering if, if that needs to be updated. Now, um, one thing. Oh, sorry. Stay in with my mic. One thing. It does look like I have some of the outlying areas, guests still in their rooms. Um, let's open up the mics. I don't know why you would have questions of me because I'm just Cindy. Um, but uh, if you have a question, I'd be happy to try and answer it for you. Do you, if, should I go down the list? We'll see. I don't know who's still there. Um, Anchorage, did you have any questions? Anchorage is gone. Okay, thank you. Do you want to, is there a way to help Here, me Here, let out? me just tell you, we have uh, Tenasket. Okay. Tenasket just wants to say that that was a very good presentation. Thank you. Um, how about Pullman? Pullman? We're here, but I don't think there are any questions. Thank, Thank you. you for staying. Have a back. beautiful day. Thank you. And I think uh, the last one is uh, Moses Lake. Moses Lake. It looked like there was a crowd maybe there. Yeah, they're still there, but I don't, they're not. Oh, they're done. Minute. They have, they do their support group meeting, I think, right after, so they might be doing that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and I have a couple, I have a question here in the room. I just. Okay, it's okay. just wanted to know the company. Um, for the bracelet? Okay, the, um, the company uh, is Road ID, um, and it's www.roadid.com. And this bracelet, I think, well, I can bring it up, but I, it's not, I think my dad's that I got for him that's completely adjustable was $29 plus five, which that's really reasonable compared to any of the ones that you can get out there. Yeah. So uh, www.awareincare.org. And I, if you find me Mary tomorrow, I can, I can give it to you tomorrow too. But I appreciate you indulging in my time. I, I do. I, I can get you a copy. But, um, yeah, so what I want to do with all this is actually we're, I'm trying to adjust to, into putting things onto the website now since we're getting the copies on online and things. But um, the this we have in a PDF, the medical, if you just – and we have it in Word as well if you want to fill it in. Um, and I have the list and everything. I can email it to you or whatever you would like. Thank you, you guys. Have a beautiful day. It's supposed to almost break a record today, 64 degrees or something like that.